Well, good morning, good day, everyone. Good night. It is good to have you on today. We are um, uh, welcoming you to the, the to the Global Kingdom Conversation, and it's good to be here today. We've got a little uh, late start, but we're going to move forward in our uh, presentation and our time together. Um, just a couple of quick things. We're going to, um, before we get started, I just want to let you know that uh, Anderson Williams sends his regrets for not being on today. Um, he was called into his physician's office, and uh, though he tried to defer till uh, tomorrow, they said, we prefer you come in today. So uh, he is absent and wanted me to convey uh, his deepest uh, personal regret for that. But he will be on next week and will be presenting to us. So we look forward to that. All right, and today we have with us uh, one of, uh, I guess a gentleman who has been coined our Caleb by Andy, uh, David Castro, who's gonna share with us uh, what's on his heart today in this conversation. And David is uh, uh, a man that um, is very humble. We've come to know him as a very humble man, one of the experience. Uh, has been around a long time and doing kingdom work in a real way for the Lord. And so we're just very grateful and honored to have David Castro on with us today. So uh, David, if you are ready, we'd like to welcome you again to the global conversation today. The mic is yours, David. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, thank you so much for the honor to be able to serve each one of the men and women that are faithfully connecting to this global conversation. And uh, I just echo uh, what Kelvin was saying about our brother Andy, uh, that we just uh, come in agreement in prayer and uh, for him as he is being looked at by his physicians today. As you know, Andy has been uh, having some physical challenges and so he was called to go today. So I feel that us, can come in agreement and just lift him in intercessory prayer. Um, when Andy called me and asked me to share with you today and just have a conversation here to provoke more conversation, I hung the phone up and I uh, right away kind of leaned back in my chair and I said, okay, this is gonna be a challenge. Uh, what can we share on? And of course, after some of you have heard me in the past, uh, I've, I've been serving God for almost 50 years and uh, 43 of those years has been very much involved in the kingdom and the preaching and the teaching and the discipling and equipping men and women all over the world for the, for the work of the kingdom. And uh, I've, I'm very passionate about the kingdom it's my whole life. It's everything to me, uh, everything. I wake up uh, thinking about the kingdom, meditating on the kingdom, and I walk throughout my day with uh, a kingdom mindset. Uh, I see everything through the glasses uh, of the kingdom. And it's been like that for many, 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 many years. And uh, wherever I've been and wherever I have had to repeatedly, by the grace of God, go back to those places to serve God. People always tell me, says, you know, you've been coming here for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Your message never changes. It's always about the kingdom, yet it's fresh, but it's always about the kingdom. A couple of years ago, I was at, in St. Thomas uh, with uh, my dear brother Gladstone Hazel, who's on this call. And it happened to be on the day of my birthday. And I didn't know, but he asked the congregation there who have known me for many years to just bring a card or have an expression of love to me. And so I, he surprised me with that. And after I finished ministering, his congregation came up to the front one by one and gave me a card. And what blessed me in those cards was not so much what was in the card. I always say at my birthday, don't send me a postcard, make sure it's a card because you can't put money in a postcard. Uh, but anyways, it was not so much what was in the card, but it's what many of the 
people and the members of this congregation said to me, and they almost said the same thing. And it was, thank you for the last 20 years, you have brought us the kingdom. For the last 17 years, every time you come here, you teach us the kingdom. For the last 12 years, we've heard the king. We know what we're going to hear when they say that David Castro is going to be here. And I, I, I share that with you as an introduction today because uh, I don't boast in myself. I boast only in my king and Lord. And I boast in the Holy Spirit. I boast in the power of the word to be able to renew my mind, to bring a transformation of thinking so that today I could give you this testimony. And so I felt that the Holy Spirit kind of just quickened me today to share a couple of things with you that has helped me to become consistent and to become uh, that always forward, fresh voice for the kingdom. And I want to start by just uh, sharing uh, two conversations that Jesus had. You know, Jesus had a conversation with a man and is registered in John chapter three. Uh, and we all know the man's name was Nicodemus. Now, as you know, Nicodemus, he was a teacher uh, in the Jewish community, uh, but he was not just a teacher. We know that he was the teacher of the teachers. In other words, he was the dean of the theology department. <laughs> he was the man that all those who wanted to learn about the law and the prophets, they would come to him. And, and that's who Nicodemus was known for. He was known for not only being a great teacher, but he was also known because he lived, he lived the law. He lived uh, the, the, what he was teaching. He lived it. He was a, a true Jew. And so in John chapter three, uh, God, through John, who wrote that gospel, tells us about this encounter, this conversation. Remember that Nicodemus came to Jesus late at night because he didn't want anybody to see him as Rabbi Nicodemus speaking to this man that was causing an uproar everywhere he was going, going and that people were coming to him, but, but he was a controversial individual in what he was saying. So Nicodemus didn't want his fellow leaders to see him, so he came late at night to talk to Jesus. And we know the conversation. There's not a one of you in this call that doesn't know the conversation. Almost every one of us here have preached tremendous evangelistic messages on that conversation. But here's where I want to draw your attention to, to that conversation. When the conversation finished, Nicodemus left. He heard everything Jesus said. And, uh, and not much happened in Nicodemus at that moment. He just left, and we are told that years went by, and it wasn't until Nicodemus saw Jesus being crucified on the cross that the conversation began, began to be a reality in him, and it woke him up spiritually. Now, the Bible doesn't register to us exactly what happened to Nicodemus, but we are told that, that Nicodemus had a, a, a change of mind and a change of heart, but it took him a while. Now, there's another conversation that is registered in the book of John also, and it just happens to be the next chapter, chapter four of John. Now, this conversation is one that Jesus has with a woman that comes to this well to draw water and to take it to the men that she worked for or a group of people. And, and she was the one that would come and draw water from the well. And this particular day, she comes to draw the water and she encounters Jesus. Once again, I don't need to go over the conversation because every one of you here, you know that conversation very well. You've also preached and taught on it. And, and brought many applause and amens and hallelujahs as a result of your teaching on, on the woman at the well. But I want to draw your attention to how the conversation finished. The woman at the well, after she had this conversation with Jesus, 
which the subject matter was exactly the same. It's just different words, but it was the same, same subject matter that Jesus spoke about. It was the kingdom and it was the gospel of the kingdom. But when the conversation finished between the woman and Jesus, the Bible tells us in John 4 that she left those things that she had brought to gather water in. She left them there and she ran back and she went to the men that she worked with and she said to them, I have met the Messiah, the Christ. And she's, the Bible says that she used the word Christ. And she told them everything that he had said and she shared and she was all excited. And as a result of that, people came out and they started looking for Jesus. Interesting. Two conversations, but at the end of the conversation, two different reaction, two different choices, uh, a total opposite. Here we have Nicodemus, a teacher of teachers, a man that knew the law and the prophets like probably nobody else in his time. Here we have a woman, a Samaritan woman at that, a Samaritan woman at that, rejected by the Nicodemuses and the Jews. And she, after having this conversation with Jesus, she has a total transformation of her thought process. She didn't wait years. We don't have to assume or maybe some historian like Josephus has to tell us what happened to the woman. No, the Bible, John is inspired by the Holy Spirit to register right there in John chapter four, her reaction immediately to what she heard from Jesus. Now, what does that have to do with our global conversation here today? I submit this to you because I believe this represents very clearly two types of people. Now, in my years of service, I have spent most of my time working with leaders. I've had to, on occasion, lead a local church, either because we were in the process of planting a local ecclesia, or because of an emergency or things that happened, I had to fill in as an interim leader. But most of the time that I have served in the last 40 plus years, when I speak about the kingdom, I, I've mainly been just working with leaders all over the world, all over Europe, Africa, United States, South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, and Asia. And I've worked with leaders. I've worked with some leaders that are very gifted, very talented, leaders with lots of knowledge, education, Leaders that have three, four, five different degrees from different academic institutions. I've also had the honor to serve with men and women that were not leaders and perhaps did not have the same academic intellectual background or theological knowledge. And I've seen where how, how they have received the gospel of the kingdom. And what I submit to you in this conversation is that in my own experience, I've seen the Nicodemuses and I've seen the spirit of the woman at the well. And today, when I thought about this conversation, I was thinking about the global group we have here. Now, I don't know most of you. I know just very few of you in person. I'm, I've gotten to know some of you in the spirit as we have served together and we are serving together here in this conversation. But, uh, you know, I think of my brother Charles who shared a couple of weeks ago about his walk in the kingdom. And he's over there in Kenya, in Africa. I wish I would have met you when I was in Kenya the several times that I went there. But, but I, I find a kindred spirit with him. 
uh, our brother that shared last week, our brother David, uh, who shared last week, Fred Tobin, who's also chaired here, and Tim, and a few others, and, and, and Kelvin, and of course, Andy. I've never met Andy in person, but I can tell you, we, we, we have a very kindred spirit. So as I thought about the, the versatility, the background of all of us here in this conversation, I, I kind of today, just for, for, for this conversation, I said, I wonder where we are. Do we have the spirit of Nicodemus or do we have the spirit of that woman at the well? If Jesus was the one speaking right now instead of David Castro, if he was the one here bringing the word of the kingdom today, if he was here speaking as he spoke in such a practical, everyday way. You know, Jesus had, had the capacity to, to speak about something so deep about the kingdom, and he knew how to do it in such a practical, applicable way to those that he spoke to. If he was here speaking and the conversation would finish, how, what, what would be our reaction to the conversation? And I want to go back to what I began to say uh, just a minute ago. In my personal experience, some of the most difficult people for them to have a metaneo, a change of mind. Remember when Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17 said, repent? The word there, repent, has nothing to do with remorse for sin of adultery or fornication or any other, whatever. The, the word there, repent, is all about a change of mind, a change of thinking. And as a result of that change of thinking, I'm going to go in a new direction. That's what the word repent was there. And what Jesus was saying, and he was speaking to the religious crowd that was listening to him, you all need to have a change of thinking to be able to see that the kingdom, the government of God, is right here in your midst. It's at hand. Well, none of them could see that. And so the, the, the question this morning is, what is hindering you to be able to receive the seed of the word of the kingdom, to be able to understand the eternal purpose of God, to be able to understand why were you created? Why do you have gifts by grace? Why are you in the position, in the function that you are in the nation, in the country, in the island where God has you? Are you there for the kingdom or are you there to continue to propagate the enemy of the kingdom, which is religion? Are you there to be part of the traditional system that has brought no fruit of the kingdom anywhere or are you truly a vessel that is in having an, in a Damascus road experience and encountered with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that is causing a metaneo, I'm using that Greek word, a change of thinking in your mind so that you go in a different direction. See, when Saul, and I'm speaking of Saul in the road to Damascus, he wasn't Paul yet, when Saul fell off his donkey, if that's what happened, and he had that encounter with the Lord, it, something happened in his mind. And we know that he was a very well-educated individual. Remember, he was carrying letters with authorization to go persecute and imprison those that were following the Christ and believing in the Jesus. And, and But on that road, he had a total change of mind. And instead of going back to where he came from, to Jerusalem, he went to another town and he encountered an individual there that not only, be, not only touched his physical eyes so he could see, but began to take the scales off his spiritual eyes and he began to see the kingdom. And he began to go through a process. He began to go in a total different direction. And 14 years later, we find that at the Ecclesia of Antioch, 
the leadership is laying hands on this man and they're sending him out as an apostle to the Gentiles because he had a transformation of his thinking. And he went in a different direction. And I believe that we're living a time, my dear brothers and sisters, my family, you're my family on Thursdays, uh, that we are living in a time right now. Uh, we're not here by coincidence. This conversation, the history of this conversation was that it started as a California, LA conversation, then went to a US conversation, and then it went to a, a, another, and then now is a global. So there, there's something that God began some years back and, and, and is taking it to where we are today. And it's not for the glory of any man. But it's because God has a purpose with each one of you that are tuning in. It's, it's God has, a, has, has had an eternal purpose that he wants you to have an understanding so that they're in Africa, they're in South Africa. I see that somebody's here from Durban. Man, I've been to Durban 10 times, one of my favorite cities in South Africa. I wish I would have met you, <laughs> my brother. But wherever you are, in Trinidad, in St. Thomas, in Florida, in California, in the UK, wherever you are today, God has a purpose, a kingdom purpose for you. You're someone that loves God. You're someone that has believed in Jesus as your savior. You've been redeemed. You've been justified. You've been born again. But religion stepped in and, and, and took you on a detour, took you on another road. And, and you've been serving and you even educated yourself and you acquired degrees and you've acquired titles and positions. But I'm telling you, you're now in a Kairos moment. You're in a specific moment of God. When God is saying to you today, if Jesus was here, he would say, repent. Not about remorse of a sin, but Repent, have a change of mind, because I've got a new direction for you. And I believe, my brothers and sisters, and I believe it with a passion, that God doesn't want us to be here from Thursday to Thursday, and three years later, you be in the same place. Oh, that's a great word, Brother Andy. Man, I love your slides. They're, what information? I love what you do. Oh, that's awesome, Brother Fred. I mean, God bless you for what he's doing and the gift he's given you and the teachings about, uh, about a citizen. Oh, Brother Tim, it's so powerful what we learned for the last three years from you for Ecclesia, but you're still in the park on Sunday morning at the same parking lot doing the same religious thing that you've been doing for the last 10, 12, 15, and living under the same fig tree, fig tree, and nothing about the kingdom. But you're here at the kingdom conversation every Thursday. I believe that in the heart of some of us that are here, and I say this because we talked about it the other day, we, we have a, a commitment and a heart and a passion to just be vessels to come along your side so that three years from now, you're not going to be parked at the same parking lot doing the same old thing, cutting the ham at both corners. You all know that story. No, I believe that God has us here and he's provoking this conversation. He's provoking us to think differently. He's provoking us to, to make some choices. Make some choices. I wouldn't be here today sharing with you with the passion that burns within me if I hadn't made some choices when I was in 1983 sitting at the top of the mountain. Because I was. I was at the top of the mountain. I was very comfortably pastoring a church, you know, with all the trimmings in the denomination that I was a part of. They took good care of you. That's one thing I can say for, the, for that denomination. They take good care of their pastors. I mean, they gave you insurance plans, depreciate. You buy an automobile and it depreciates, they would give us depreciation refund. 
for the car that I was using in ministry. And I had the parsonage. I mean, I was at the top of the mountain. But I had to make a choice. Was I going to be a Nicodemus and just go back to the synagogue and keep being the teacher of teachers and doing the same thing that I'd been doing, promoting the law and the prophets? I'm just liking it to Nicodemus. Or am I going to be the woman at the well that goes back and says, you know what? I had an encounter with Christ. The anointed one that comes to govern the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He not only said some things about me, but he's transformed me. He, he even taught me the difference between religious worship and worshiping in spirit and truth. And, and, and that's, that's a question that I have for you today. I want to stir you. I want to provoke you to quit procrastinating. I mean, I know you love your titles. I know that, you, you know, you, you, it's hard for you to throw those cars that cost you so much with so many titles on them. I know you love your, your traditional board meetings and whatever and sit there at the head and, and all that. And, 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 and I mean, you've been doing it for so long. I know that you really are convinced that's kingdom work. I want to tell you something. That's dead works. Because it has nothing to do with God's eternal purpose. The number one problem in Christianity today is the lack of understanding of God's eternal purpose. And by the way, if I may, uh, Kelvin, if, uh, if I'm out of order, you correct me right away. Just unmute yourself and stop me. But uh, Brother Fred Tobin, he has a tremendous platform for the kingdom. And he's invited me to do a series on God's eternal purpose for the next five weeks, starting this coming Sunday. And, uh, and just to let you know, we're going to be teaching on God's eternal purpose for five weeks. And uh, I think that Fred can probably give you the link if it's all right, so that some of you might want to tune in in the different countries that you're in, and he'll give you the time. But the Christianity around the world, I had a conversation here in San Antonio, Texas, uh, a few days ago with, with a couple of major leaders in this city. And, and I asked them, I said, you know, I've known you guys for a long time. Just tell me, what do you believe is the heart of God's will and eternal purpose for San Antonio? And, the, and these are mature well-known, one of the leaders that I was talking to, he has a lot of books that he's written and everything. He's very well-known. I couldn't believe the answer. My five-year-old son, I think, could have given me a better answer. I, and I'm not being here. I really believe that my five-year-old son, I have a five-year-old son named Samuel. I, I believe that he would have given me a better answer than those two men gave me about God's eternal purpose. There is a total lack in the leadership of Christianity about understanding God's eternal purpose. And I believe I know the reason why, because the spirit of religion has brought another purpose, has brought another emphasis. It's what I call the fig tree principle with all the fig leaves. And so everyone is representing their own little group or denomination, or network, or call it what you want to call it, and, and, and we've got our doctrine, we've got our beliefs, we've got our vision, and, it, and we're out there, and, and, and so everybody's doing their thing, and they forgot that this is all about God's eternal purpose, and it's God's eternal purpose because it had existed from the beginning, From the beginning of the Godhead, it, God's eternal purpose has existed before the angels were created. Before the angels were created, the eternal purpose of God already existed in the Godhead. So, if we don't have as leaders 
in the different countries and nations and places where God has it. If we don't have an understanding of God's eternal purpose, how can we go about the Lord's work? See, most people talk about the Lord's work through the interpretation of the Lord's work within the organization or ecclesiastical system or denomination that you have been credentialed, taught, raised up in, ordained in, or whatever. But God's eternal purpose. And I want to touch on that one point, and then I want to open it up for conversation here this morning. I, I'm I, Honestly, what I'm speaking to you, I want to provoke in you a conversation about what's my next step? What is preventing me from truly taking a different direction? Because I meet men and women all over the place and they love the kingdom message and they've read all the books that so-and-so and others have written and they've gone to kingdom conferences and they've picked up kingdom vocabulary and kingdom lingo and they incorporate it in their religious whatever and, and it makes them sound a little different, but they don't know in good English beans about the kingdom. They don't know in a, in, in a daily living lifestyle of the kingdom. You know what made Jesus so unique when he was on earth and so different to all the other teachers that existed? That Jesus walked, lived every word that he taught and he preached. Everything he taught, he lived it. He walked it. It was not a theory. It was not a doctrine. It was not a theology. It was not a belief. It was his life because he came here to do the will of the Father. And that's what he's called us to do. We're his disciples. And if we're his disciples, then we, we need to do what he did. Do the will of the Father. So if I'm doing the will of certain organization, then I've already usurped the will of the Father in me. So what must I do to be able to get in line with the eternal purpose of God and the will of the Father? I like to make that the number one question today and, and see if we can talk about it. Second, I want to submit something about the, the, the eternal purpose of God. And this is the first thing that I personally learned. And this is what, what, what changed my, my direction, my emphasis, how I approach scripture. It completely changed how I approach scripture. And it was when I understood that the kingdom of God is a government, not a religious institution, not an ecclesiastical system, not a denomination but that the kingdom is God's government. And that government has spiritual laws, spiritual principles, and spiritual truth. Government. And that I, by the choice of the God of that kingdom, I was brought in. I was adopted. I was purchased by the blood of Jesus to be a citizen of that government of that spiritual nation. Government. The government has an order. The government has spiritual laws, spiritual principles, spiritual truth. They're eternal. They don't change. God doesn't have in his spiritual laws, spiritual truth, and spiritual principles a different law for one race and another one for another race. His spiritual laws and principles and truth are applicable to every single human being, every kindred, nation, tongue, and person, every. The government of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of the things I love about God 
that I haven't found one single text where he gets his committee together or in a boardroom to change some things. Not one. If anything, his scripture, his word keeps reminding us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Godhead, the Alpha, the beginning is the same all the way through till the end. The message, the government, the truth, the principles, the laws never have changed. And we are citizens of that government. Understanding that the kingdom is a government, when you get that understanding, what does it mean to be under the government of God? I can tell you that's the beginning of walking a different direction. Because the government of the denomination, as good as it might be, as old as it might be, as successful as you think they are. You know, I, I, I hear a lot of religious leaders boasting about success. I say, hey, be careful. The underworld, they, they boast of their success. The country that I come from, the most revered individual in that country is Pablo Escobar because of his drug cartel. So let's don't say that because something has success, it's from God. But that's what religion has done. It has used the word success, doing their thing, their way, totally opposite and contrary to the government of God, because they use the name God and the name Jesus and the Bible verses. But yet the spirit is not the spirit of the kingdom. The fruit doesn't bear the fruit of the kingdom. And the order of the kingdom is not being established in the nations, in the communities, in the families. There is no glory that is transforming because it's not the government of God the spiritual government of God. So I don't know, Kelvin, how long I was supposed to go here, but I just felt impressed. I wanted to keep it simple. I want, I want to cause uh, just, just to provoke. And, and there might be some here that in this conversation that are right now on the edge of their seat saying, wow, man, I want to make that first step. I want, I want you to know if that's you, there are men and women right here that are part of this conversation that are 100% committed to lifting your arms, to coming alongside. See, if I hadn't had men that God sent me to come along my side, to teach me, to help me walk the process, to, to, to help me, just help me as I was making the turn to go in a different, I, I would have never, I had to have others to disciple to disciple, to mentor. And I'll finish with this. You cannot disciple men and women in the kingdom from the pulpit. That is a lie and a deception that Satan has had the religious institutions incarcerated for thousands of years. You do not disciple and mentor men and women in the kingdom from the pulpit. That's why the kingdom is not a Sunday morning service. It's a seven day lifestyle. That's what Jesus was. That's why Jesus didn't go to church on Sabbath or Sunday or Monday. It was all seven days for him. He was always discipling, always mentoring, always speaking about the kingdom. That's the kingdom. So Kevin, uh, anybody have anything to say? Yeah questions i'll turn it over to you and i'll be here to all right well thank you david for a powerful presentation um very stimulating very provoking um as was your your point uh in doing this today i wanted to just uh raise something very fundamental i believe for the kingdom and and our approach to understanding it our approach to seeing it and our approach to eventually participating in it. 
and and uh, Jesus says to Nicodemus something um, very key. He said, "Except you be uh, born again, except you come as a child." Yes. Um, can you can you elaborate a little bit on that, David? Because here's the thing: yes. when I'm coming out of the religious institution, I'm coming with a set of my own competencies. I'm coming in with my own experiences and uh, God may have used me, but I'm, I'm coming into an environment now where my heart must be postured to learn. And so how do I unload and unpack? And, and how do I finally come to a place where I realize that where I come from isn't necessarily what I will be participating in as it comes to the kingdom? versus church institution. And I know you know what that means because you're a pastor's son as I have been. And so uh, please speak to that briefly. Boy, that's a powerful question, uh, Calvin. And, uh, and, and I'm glad that you bring it up because that is key. That is key. And the key is, and, and that's why Jesus spoke those words. You know, you gotta be like a child. Uh, you, you have to be innocent like a child. You, you have to be unlearned like a child. This is why I said what I said earlier to you. This is why we have such a contrast in John chapter 3, the conversation with Nicodemus, and John chapter 4 with this woman at the well. See, Nicodemus, while he's listening to Jesus, he's in his mind, he's reasoning as a Jew, as a teacher of the law and of the prophets. And he, he can't even fathom the spiritual principle and the spiritual law that Jesus is saying to him that you got to be born again. And he comes back with that ridiculous answer to Jesus. Well, can an old man like me go back into my mother's? But, I mean, that, 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 that is an idiotic answer. That showed Nicodemus true colors. He was an idiot, even though he had a high degree when it came to the teaching of the law. But in spiritual things, he didn't know anything. And he couldn't even understand. So the key to be able to begin to understand the government of God, the kingdom gospel, the eternal gospel, is you have to die. You have to bury everything you've learned. I grew up, I, I mean, I mentioned here, you know, I was born on the front pew of the, of the, of the church building, you know, and I grew up a, a leader. My dad was not just a local church pastor, he was a leader. And I grew up in the home of a leader and, 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 and a denominational leader with many leaders around. I grew up in that. All I grew up listening was leadership, doctrine, theology, doctrine, theology, and, and I had to go to every meeting because back in the 40s and the 50s, that's the way it was. Everybody went. Now the kids are able to stay home, <laughs> but not back in my days. And so, 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 and then when I went into the ministry, that's all I knew. What I had learned, I was proud of it. Man, some of the doctrines, you know, I mean, they were the pillars of the faith. But when the word repent. I got to have a change of mind came to me. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, the Holy Spirit had me take a legal pad and write on one side, everything that I held so dear to my heart as the doctrines of my denomination. And then to, to just write on the other side, how much of that I, I understood it to be the gospel of the kingdom. And when I saw the contrast, I said, well, I, th this is lopsided. And so I had to, in my heart, make a choice. And when I made the choice, I mean, you know, my family came against me. Uh, I had to resign. I mean, it was, I, I literally lost it all <laughs> because I made the choice. But I didn't just resign from the denomination, but in my mind, I made a choice all these doctrines and stuff, if I'm going to truly be able to learn what God wants to teach me, I've got to die. Because here was my continual tendency at the beginning, was that I was trying to defend what I had believed, what my dad believed, what I grew up in with the king. If I would try to defend it, or I would try to see how, how I could make the two fit. 
I, I, I would try to, now, I, I, this belief, it's got to be kingdom. It's got, and, 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 and I would, and it didn't work. So I finally gave up. I got so tired of that and I had to die. So to make that transition and to understand the words, you got to be like little children, unlearned, innocent. You got to die. That's why I don't like titles. I don't use them. You know, out of honor and respect, I will call men their title because I know they're hung up on it. But I, I, you know, we're just brothers. I have a function. But a lot of the titles that we have today in the body of Christ, they're, they're fleshy, soulish titles that only give glory to the ego of man or to present them as what they know. If you walk into my office, you won't see a single title hung on the wall or a single certificate of any university. I'm, I'm, I, I have... I, I'm graduated from your, I got a master's degree. I mean, but because for me, I consider those things dunk. And, and every day I have to die more and more to those things to be able to receive the mysteries of the eternal purpose of God, as it says in Ephesians 3.11. So the key is that. And, and to me, that's what Jesus was speaking about, Calvin, when he said that. And it's the, the unlearned innocence. We've got to come like a little baby wanting milk, like a little baby wanting that, that be breastfed. You know, once, once the baby finds out where that breast is, I tell you, he, if, if you've had babies and, and your wives have breastfed them, you know how the babies just go to it. Because they know where the where the food is, they're hungry for it. Well, that that that's what that's what God wants from us. He wants us so hungry that we're going to the to the breast seeking seeking. First, we got to get the milk. We got to learn how to digest the milk. The problem with many leaders, they don't want to digest milk. They want some big word that they can incorporate for next Sunday morning's message, so that they'll sound like, "Look at the revelation I brought today." That doesn't work. Second, since I said that, when the Lord reveals something to you, for you to effectively be able to teach it and effectively be able to disciple and mentor others, you've got to live it yourself. You've got to live it yourself. That word that you, that became a revelation illumined by the Holy Spirit has got to become a burning word in you that you live, no matter how small it is, no matter what. You know, one of the first principles that, that the kingdom taught me was the principle of honor. And I thought I was a very honorable man. I came out of the military, learned a lot of honor in the military, but I realized when it came to the kingdom, I wasn't a very honorable man. And I learned honor. And it had such an impact in me. And, and it transformed me as a man. It transformed me as a husband, how I see a woman. Transformed me as, as how I serve men and women in the, in the body of Christ. Honor. It transformed me about being on time, punctuality. I spent many years in Norway, Scandinavian countries. And the Norwegians used to say to me, he says, we are shocked because you're Hispanic and you always arrive five, 10 minutes before we do. We've never met a Hispanic that's on time. I said, I'm not Hispanic. I'm a kingdom citizen. It's a big difference. As a Hispanic, I'm late. As a kingdom citizen, I honor. So I arrive early. You can only get to that when you die to self. When you die and when you begin to walk it and live it. I've got some men that are on this call that have known me for many, many years. They can testify. I don't boast in myself. I boast in, in the Holy Spirit and the power of the word and the Lordship of Christ that has transformed my mind. Do not be 
conformed to the world. Yo hablo español, I'm Hispanic, but the kingdoms of this world are not my kingdom. I'm a kingdom citizen first and a Hispanic about 10th down the list. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question there, Kevin. <laughs> Yes, it did. It did. There are uh, there's some hands raised, and I just want to uh, to say uh, that um, before we, we we get to the hands, I, I want to just say this about we need to consider the dangers of being in a uh, situation like Nicodemus, um, who was an influencer, and Jesus asked, "You don't know these things, so what are you?" conveying to the people. So it just wasn't about Nicodemus. It was about the people he was influencing. Right. This so wasn't about his eyes being open. He had to be equipped to open up the eyes of others. So I'm just thinking about in terms of that, if we don't inculcate ourselves with the kingdom in the right way, um, we will not pass on what we should pass on and influence those who the Lord would have for us to. So. All right, we have Joel McDowell and we have uh, Gladstone. Uh, hey, Joel, you have the mic. Thank you. Uh, oh, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, hi, David, thank you for um, um, the word that you shared. But it's just on a couple of points, I have questions. I myself am looking to pursue a um, degree in theology. And um, I do believe that, I, I hear you say that, you know, these things don't really matter. The certificates you don't hang up in your thing. And it's not that I'm gonna go hanging mine up, but it's just, I do believe that when it says study yourself to be approved uh, in Timothy, um, study to show thyself approved unto God, a man that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I believe that there is a preparation to be had and it, it mustn't be overlooked because your degree is what helped you assimilate. That, ass that volume of word in you helped you to assimilate uh, the thoughts that you're having right now. Without it, I don't think you would have been able to reach the processing uh, ability that you have right now. Because even Paul, when you consider him, um, while he was killing Christians and everything, he was a very red man. And, and, and then after um, the word in him was appreciated correctly and the Holy Spirit was able to teach him uh, the, the, the correct understanding of things, then he was able to use the Old Testament to just to uh, was able to reference the New Testament into the Old Testament and, and, and marry things up so that it, it shows that the entire book is a testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's, that's just my two cents because um, of course I'm, I'm not one that I believe that only God is to be called Reverend, as it says in Psalms. I trust me, I don't. I I'm not a huge title person myself, but um, I think there is definitely strong merit in studying, and of course, acting on what you study and not just studying it, as it says in James. You you want to be about the word, not just read it. So um, that's, or maybe I, I got you wrong. Um, Th that's my two cents. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Any comments on that, uh, David? Uh, I am all for education. Uh, I have children and I, they've, every one of them have been educated <laughs> and, and the little ones, uh, he's five years old, he's in school getting educated right now. <laughs> and uh, I'm all for education. Uh, I think that it's important. Uh, it enhances uh, the purpose of God in many people's life. Uh, there are millions that could never fulfill the purpose that God has for them if they didn't have some measure of education in certain areas. Here's where more specifically, I, I, I defer from the value and the emphasis that religion has put on religious education, on, on, the, on the lean that each denomination gives 
to the scriptures so that it'll fit their whatever theological interpretation they've come to a conclusion and they want to propagate or they want to teach to their followers. This is where uh, it, it becomes a problem. And what I'm saying is that many, many leaders today, and I, I know this by experience, because they've achieved some of these high theological uh, academic uh, accomplishments, they seem to, to value that and it has made who they are as a vessel. And so their whole, their preaching, their leadership style and everything, it, you can see it, it's, it's all enveloped in this academia, religious leaning of the specific type of theology or doctrine or et cetera that they were trained in. Some more than others, because some denominations are much more legalistic than others. What I'm saying is, to that, to that religious, where, where scriptures have been twisted, where scriptures have been taken out of context and made a pretext and made a, a doctrine uh, and a belief system within that system. I'm speaking to those and, and those men and women that have accomplished that knowledge and that title or whatever, when they are banking on that and they're defending that, and, and that's the heart of their message. That's what brings not only a hindrance to understanding the kingdom, but much more to being able to be a living testimony for the kingdom. Uh, I'm all for education. Go ahead, Calvin. Thank you. Thank you for that, David. Yes, uh, it is very possible to do several years of seminary and at the end of it um, be unserviceable for God. A lot of times these people, they write a lot of these commentaries that haven't really had a, a personal relationship with God, but they have scholastically um, reached a certain level of, of history and understanding of those kind of things and been able to do those things. So we know that to be true as well. All right, Gladstone. Good afternoon. Um, yes. uh, thank you, Apostle Castro, for your timely word. I wanted to, if you permit me, to share of my transition with you, um, if I could, Apostle Castro. Yes, yes, go ahead. All right. The reason I said this is because when you said that uh, many people on the program for a very long time, However, they might have heard about the teaching of the kingdom and, and might be uh, having maybe some problems in implemented into your local church. I want to submit to you, and if I forgot anything, you're free to deal with it. My first thing is that um, when it's going in one direction, it takes a skilled captain to in the wrong direction, you take a skill captain to turn the ship around in the right direction. And yes. you just don't grab the wheel and spin it around. Otherwise everybody might be found on the bottom of the ocean. Yes. <laughs> um, and one of the things I want to submit to our leaders today is the process. Even though that we have been on the line many times, I think what we need more than ever before is to share a process where one can move from where they are to another level. Yes, you might hear the teaching. Yes, you might think you could say it. Yes, you might think you could do things, but the word of God is built upon here a little and there a little bit little. There yeah. must be a foundation building. Otherwise we'll turn the whole ship over. The idea is that the leaders on this call must give an idea of a process. When I, when I first met you some 45, 40 something years ago, the idea was that you came many times before we ever implement anything in the local church 
and taught leadership. You, you taught eldership. You yeah. pour into the eldership of the church that yeah. the eldership could understand. Maybe listening to us this afternoon, there are many, many people who not only have one church, but churches. So therefore, you're not going to be able to talk to teach an eldership. You need to te teach many elders from different locations that must come together and don't be afraid to ask questions, to um, be able to define the word, make sure what is said is definitely from a scriptural background. Because when you get up from a pulpit, maybe you go to, a, and you come from this particular setting and you go to your church, just jumping up saying, I have something new, I will have something new, even though you have some things, some things new. There's a process to all this operation here. And I wish that we would develop a process and share it to the others. You, you brought me a book concerning, concerning the New Testament survey, one of the books that was very instrumental in some guidance and some other literature, which was um, important as a guideline. This um, writer was very doctrinal they were able to define it from scripture. It wasn't a guesswork. What was you spoke was directly um, in the book. You had literature of your own. Maybe what we should do is teach a process for people who now have uh, limited knowledge or some knowledge or plenty knowledge to say, this is the process. Now, the other thing that you do, you have a flock and people are going to have different um, point of views. We didn't lose anybody in our church to turn this thing around because of the process and wisdom that was executed by you in dealing with this. So I don't want people to take broadly and just go in their pulpit, begin to say things without a foundation, without any building, without any particular thing because they say something new. It, 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 it will be detrimental. A good thing could be a bad thing. The next thing is support. There's quite a number of people I've listened to for some some um, weeks now, not saying anything, but um, I believe that we here in the program and you who are in leadership of this should have a support system whereby two ways, when someone wants to teach something, I, I even do it right now with Apostle Castro over these 40 something years, if I find something new, Wherever in the world, I call you, I submit it to you, I go over it, we take out the kinks, then I teach it. I just don't jump up something because I have a brand new revelation in this particular area and run and tell people, and I'm totally not in line with what the kingdom is, message is all about. This must be in this group, a, a, a group of pastors who are able to be touchable, that you can call on, that you can say, these are resource persons, give you books to read, gear, gear, gear you in the right direction, based upon the foundation aspects that you're going to be, be, be teaching with support materials and support help from eldership that is here. And then not only that, there must be a uptime, uh, give the word out in particular season and then Maybe some of these same leaders of this uh, uh, kingdom message should be um, avail themselves in seminars, even on Zoom or, or whatever, to to or or in person, to to share with the developing churches what is so necessary for kingdom building, and by doing so, not only there's a presence on this line. There are seminars dealing with particular aspects of the kingdom in the area of foundational building. Then another step in the availability of teachers and leaders that you can call, teachers and leaders who is available to speak into your life and to, to make sure that when you submit to their teachings that you're able to listen to them and you understand fully from scripture what you're going to implement. If we just come and we, 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 we hear a word and we hear something, an essence here and an essence there, 
they are very good things. But I think that we need to develop a building block approach to bring in all the new persons who want to begin to move in this direction, who are not sure and who would be happy to move in the direction, but they would need some help to make it happen. I submit that to you, Apostle Castro. Thank you. Thank you, Gladstone. Uh, first of all, I wanna say it's been an honor to serve you all these years. You're an awesome man of God, having tremendous impact in the Caribbean. I have the highest respect and love for you and your family. And uh, it's an honor that you're here with us in this conversation. This is the first time you've spoken in this conversation, and I believe that we're going to be enriched in the future as you contribute more. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that the, the core team has already been speaking about doing exactly what you are suggesting, my brother, and that is to be able to be available, two, three, four, five, whatever, to help individuals, or maybe two or three, uh, and, and, and using different platforms. Uh, to be able to come alongside and help and do exactly what you're saying. This, this is exactly what's, uh, what, what I believe was one of the reasons this became the global conversation. And the format is gradually being changed uh, to make it more applicable, to make it more, more useful to those that are part of the conversation. Uh, I believe that probably Kev, Kelvin or, or Fred uh, could probably talk more about what I'm saying. Uh, they've been in on the planning more, but I know that this is the heart of the direction that we're going. As a matter of fact, the thing that got me excited to continue to be is it's when I heard that that's the direction we want to go using some powerful resources of individuals that God has within this group that is here today. Tell them you can share more on that. Absolutely. And um, uh, Andy will probably be going into more detail on that uh, next week regarding the, the, the basis and the purpose of this call and things like that. But it, to concur with you, uh, David, we have been in planning regarding uh, these very things, how to make this call serviceable to leaders yes. to, uh, for empowerment for encouragement and for the building of leaders that it just doesn't turn into what uh, Andy mentioned about a, a, a talk shop, a, a, chop, a talk shop, which, which uh, you know, there's plenty of those out there, but we want, we want to present a different offering. And I'm really grateful for those who uh, God has called together. We have Charles O'Peel, as was mentioned from Kenya, who was with us, Ivan, who is not present with us today, Ivan Gonzalez, yourself, David Castro, Frederick Tobin out of the UK, we have Tim Kurtz out of Michigan, uh, Anderson uh, out of uh, New York and myself. And so we're grateful for this, um, this team that is comprised, that is thinking toward how we can better provide a service for uh, God's people and, and strength to, to leaders in these things. So very, very, very good. So. Thank you, uh, Gladstone, for your comments, and uh, Joel, for your comments uh, as well. Uh, do we have anyone from the team that would like to make comments uh, on what we've heard from David? Uh, we open this up to you at this point. I think that the uh, issue of uh, the kingdom and the foundational approach that uh, David raised here today, I think is very, very key. We wanna make sure that our understanding and the application of the kingdom is standing on strong legs and we have to be reorientated. Um, that was uh, one of the reasons for having a change of mind that we get reorientated to the things that God would have for us to be and to do, um, to, to, to pull us away from those things that we find comfort in, the things that are familiar. You remember the woman at the well, Jesus is describing uh, her thirst to her. She came from natural water, but he's describing her thirst. And then she went religious on him and said, yeah, our fathers used to worship in this mountain. You know, she, she, you know, she, <laughs> she turned religious on him. So, uh, you know, it's good. That there are people who can have a working knowledge of what the institution has provided for them. Okay. In their sincerest ways, but 
you know, how is that impacting your spiritual thirst? So um, we had a couple of, of uh, questions here in the chat and a couple of comments. Let's see. We have here, uh, are these from Levita Collins here in uh, Los Angeles, are these Bible colleges, are they teaching the kingdom of God? And uh, Veronica Williams uh, chimed in. She said, my thought exactly, are the teachings, kingdom teachings inside of these colleges? Um, I I'm sure they do bring some level of uh, um, history and, and formal training, all those kind of things. And I don't think that uh, David Castro was really uh, talking down on that. There is another education that I think that we should really consider and think about. And that is an education of the human spirit. Uh, you know, that is, that is divinely orchestrated where God begins to, to deal with our hearts. And we go through a process of self-denial. And as I said before, the reorientation of ourselves and being bought and recalibrated in many instances to ground zero you know, to allow God to make us over again and to, uh, to strip us of the things that have not been official for us, for his kingdom, and for those that are around us. And that can be an arduous process and one that can take years. But if we give ourselves to it, uh, we can find great benefit and great, uh, great strength in that. Calvin, if I may jump in a minute. Please here. do, please do. Uh, one, one of the questions I hear a lot from leaders when they start hearing the, the gospel of the kingdom and they're beginning to get a little glimpse of it. One of the questions I heard quickly is, well, with the ministry that we're doing right now here, uh, we're really envisioning uh, impacting our community. Uh, we want to help uh, single woman and abused women, and, and we have a ministry to this, and how can the kingdom uh, help us to do that? And, and I use that example, and it, there can be many other uh, areas that, you, that ministries are involved or have a vision for, maybe to impact the business community, perhaps to uh, impact the agricultural community, uh, the political scene. And so, uh, leaders are always asking, okay, so how does the kingdom fit into this? And my answer has always been the same. It says, the gospel of the kingdom is to impact the world, everything. Uh, I'm not too much of a subscriber of the seven mountains or the 10 or the 12. Uh, I like the unlimited. Okay, and I'm not putting that down. I think those, those brothers that came up with the, those emphasis, great. They, they, they kind of brought a, an attention to some areas. But, but I believe that the kingdom is unlimited. Uh, I'll give you an example, if I may. Uh, some years ago, there was a community outside of Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, it, was, it was another city right next to it called Guadalupe. At that time, this, this is about 10 years ago, uh, Guadalupe was one of the most violent cities in the entire world, not just in Mexico, but in the entire world. I remember going to Guadalupe on several occasions and, and getting up in the morning to go get some coffee and leaving the hotel and seeing men that had been hung from the bridges and they were still alive, but they were dying and nobody would touch them, not even the police department, because the, if, if anybody dared touch them, they'd be up there hanging. And there were uh, shootings every single day. I mean, it was a very dangerous. The churches in that community, they could not meet on uh, in the evenings because it was so dangerous to go out at night. The police department was 99.9% .9 corrupted full of corruption. Uh, the people feared more the police department than they did the criminals. That was the condition of this community. I had a couple of individuals, leaders, young men that had been discipling for about four years. And all of a sudden they had a passion to see how they could take the kingdom to the police department. They, they, and so they asked me, they said, help us 
in how we can impact the police department with the order and the principles of the kingdom. And my answer to them was, remember, this is God's purpose. And God is more interested in impacting the police department than you are. So let's ask God. Let's ask God for a strategy and for a direction. Now, I'm not going to take up a lot of time here to tell you, but God gave us the strategy. The strategy that God gave first was to just pray for the police, intercede. To the point that these men, these two individuals, the two leaders, one was pastoring one congregation, another one, another one. They would walk on the streets and they'd come up to a police cruiser, a car, and they would lean up against it and they would pray and they would intercede. And, and that's how it began. It began. One day, unexpectedly, they get a phone call. Now, these were two individuals that they weren't well known in the city. They didn't have a huge ministry. They had congregations of around 200 to 300 each. And they get a call. And on the other end of the call, there's a voice that says, I have just been selected by the mayor to be the new chief of the police department. And I'm moving here from another city. And when I left that city, I am a believer. I asked my pastor there if he knew anybody where my family could congregate here in this city. And your name was given to me. And so I'm calling you to ask you, what is the address of your congregation so that my family can congregate there because we are believers. And so he, this brother gave them the information. Three weeks after this man and his family began to come to this congregation, they, they, they began to hear the kingdom gospel. So this man who was, had the rank of a colonel in the police department, he's the chief now. He comes to, to this leader and he says, you know, I've only been here three weeks. And every week I hear in your message something I've never heard before. You're not teaching doctrine or theology or this, but you're teaching principles that are applicable for everyday life. And he said to him, I was brought here by the mayor to transform this corrupted police department. And I'm having a battle. I, it's, 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 I'm not having too much success. Can I ask you to come and speak to my officers? and share with them some of what you're sharing here to the congregation, some of those principles. That's how it began. Let me go now fast forward. Within a year, within one year, that police department was completely transformed. They ended up having to prune it and get rid of many policemen. Many resigned. It got down to a very small force. But when they got it all back up, now the kingdom had penetrated the police department and all of a sudden the policemen were not corrupt anymore and the officers were not corrupt and all of a sudden the citizens of the of guadalupe began to trust the police department and i could go on and on you can go on youtube and you can on look up Guadalupe Police Department transformation. There's a bunch of videos because the BBC and CNN and a bunch of the uh, news media went down there. They couldn't believe what they were hearing, what had happened. And in a matter of three years, Guadalupe went from being the third most violent town in the world to being the safest town in Mexico. And what happened? was kingdom principles, kingdom truth. It wasn't that, that the church took over the police department. It wasn't that a pastor became the police chief. No, 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 no. The same policeman, officer, and the same chief, only with different principles, different truth. And it transformed. The next mayor that came in, he then said, he, the first day, he dedicated the city to the Lordship of Christ. I stood on the platform to the side when he was doing it, and he turned the keys of the city to Jesus Christ as Lord. And then he asked, 
he asked the, the spiritual leaders, kingdom men and women, to come to his office every Tuesday morning and pray over the agenda of the city. So what I'm saying to you is the, the gospel of the kingdom is applicable anywhere and everywhere. Many think that they have to abandon their passion because of the kingdom. On the contrary, on the contrary, the gospel of the kingdom and the principles and the truth and the order and the government of the kingdom is going to enhance you to be able to bring your vision that you have burned for, for whatever area you have been wanting to do this. I, I don't know. I just felt impressed to bring that uh, uh, testimony and to share because some might be asking that. And I see that Charles, my brother's got his hand up. Yes, he does. Yes. Charles, welcome. Uh, the mic is yours, Charles. Thank you. Thanks, Calvin. Thanks, David, for that profound just breakdown of a number of issues. I just want to weigh in on a, one or two thoughts that came up in the conversation and just may, maybe just like uh, help everybody come to a, a certain understanding of why we even have this platform. And I think um, we will be sharing later on, the, we, we have eight parameters that we looked at and just in a, in a very simple highlight without going into them, one of the issues that we want to have this be is a place of impact, exactly the way David has put it. We, we are not trying to give direction. We are creating an environment where people can find direction. Yes, amen. That, that's, that's really what this is about. And, and it's not, and we, we, we've collectively have come from such diverse movements of the kingdom of God. And we found such synergy on what doesn't work and on what works. Some through our own mistakes, some through our journey, some through our experiences. So we, we, are not, we do not intend to replicate what hasn't worked. Neither is there some sort of a new movement or recruiting platform into a particular direction. It, it's more an, a wider exposure of the kingdom so more people can benefit from it. Yes. So I, yeah, I just thought that was one of the things I needed to weigh in on. And then the other thing I wanted to weigh in on was um, there was a conversation around theology or not. And, and I think the reference was made to Paul. And I think one of the most interesting thing about Paul is that he will outline his CV, so to speak, Pharisee of Pharisees, and really bring it all out and then says, you know what? I learned all about it to destroy it. And that's really a, like an oxymoron. You know, he, he, he is the master. In our day, he would be having a PhD in the law. And then he tells us we're not functioning by law, but by grace. Yeah. So he didn't get it to defend it. He literally was allowed by God to go through it and to be the only authorized person who would dare say there was something wrong with it because of his credentials. So, so this, this becomes quite a bit of an oxymoron in how some of the places that we are sent to the top of in Babylon is for us to literally then be the ones with the right to explain that it doesn't work so that others don't have to go down that path and discover that. So, so there is that balance that, that, that we, like we said, there is, I mean, Moses topped the highest seat in Egypt to bring Egypt down. I mean, the kingdom is an oxymoron in many ways. So, so well, as we speak about education and theology, like we said, it's, it's, the question is the why, the why. Why would I want to go down that road is probably bigger. Did, did God ask me to go down that road? Or do I think if I go down that road, I'll find God? So, so th those are, I think, going to be major debates that will discover more of a conversation. So it's not so much about the merits and the demerits, but about how much impact the kingdom gets out of that journey, so to speak. And, and, and I, I think, having said that, the whole idea of how, I like how David put it, that a lot of people, and I mean, we've all experienced this asking, or oh, with this that I'm doing and this ministry that I'm doing, how does the kingdom paraphrase to fit in. And, and the simple answer is that it doesn't. That's really the simple answer. It's the other way around. How does what you're doing fit into the greater kingdom agenda? That is a better question because when you see the bigger kingdom agenda, then you see what you're doing from a better perspective. 
as opposed to trying to find out what you can hold on to and what the kingdom can kind of lend to. If you attempt that, there's going to be major conflict that may leave you more bruised than blessed. So those are just some of my thoughts for today. Great, great input and insight, Charles. Thank you. Thank you for those things. Um, strong reminders and, and very insightful things there. I mean, what can we, um, what, what is what we're doing have to do with the kingdom instead of trying to to stuff our agenda into it. And so, um, which is the reason for the death again, the death to ourselves, which is the reason for coming as a child, which is the reason for abandoning the things that we've known and coming to be a student, to listen and to learn. Um, this, is, this is very, very great, very great. Anyone, uh, uh, Frederick, do you have any comments uh, on what we, what's being shared here today? Um. Yeah, a few a few things I might add. Um, first, I just wanted to thank David for for really just um, setting a really strong context on on how different people interface with the kingdom, citing the examples from the Gospels. Um, I thought they were really potent and very important. Um, I just wanted to add that I think one of the one of the things that maybe we need to take on board is that before we came to faith, um, the kingdom existed and was working in the affairs of men. When we wake up to the kingdom, it's as if we suddenly recognize something to be there that previously was, was shut from us or closed to us. And I find it interesting that we often in coming into an awareness of the kingdom suddenly have this great concern about how the kingdom is shared within our sphere which is a, a, a i think a good motivation however it lacks a recognition that the kingdom is already in our sphere and the emphasis is about how we we become a conduit of it rather than we are the ones leveraging the kingdom in the midst of the kingdoms of the world. And, and the reason why I say that is because when I look at, for example, the, the text that David cited, you know, um, I've, said, I've said this in, in other conversations, we serve a living God and a living God is not, is not a God that isn't involved in the affairs of state and in the affairs of the kingdoms of the world. And, when these people encounter Jesus, whether it's Nicodemus or the woman at the well, it's encountered in, in, their, in their affairs. The kingdom comes into their affairs. It challenges them. It, it shakes them. Mm -hmm. And it continues on after them. Yes. And I think it's important because there's a part of this where we need to see the bigger picture of the kingdom at work beyond our sphere which we would we, we could hone down to be the sovereignty of God um, over everything. And why is that why is that important? Because the scope of our sight is going to effectively impress upon us the nature of how we co-labor. I hope I'm I'm making sense. Yes. So, yes. Yes. so one of the things is that the kingdom doesn't start and stop with us we don't have and, and this is what's happened in the training within the context of denominationalism and within the context of church is that we switch god on and we switch god off because it's subject to our activity and i think why jesus was such a threat to the to the uh, religious order of the day which was actually a governmental order the reason why he was a threat to them was because he was revealing a kingdom that was working beyond the, their sensibilities and working beyond the parameters of their senses. They could not fix him in a particular position. And, you know, this, we hear utterances, for example, in terms of where the spirit leads and the direction of the spirit and a man not knowing. And then that gives us an example of the fact that the kingdom is working outside of the sphere of our senses. And it is, it is by God's grace that he determines to make us aware 
of what he is of what is being done and i liken it to um to peter where he did not go up to you know to the roof to have a vision he did not go up to the roof to get a tr- to deliberately pursue god for a vision or trance it says he was up there and all of a sudden he was in a vision and a trance and the lord said kill a need and he's like i can't do that and suddenly the lord is working outside the sphere of his senses challenging him that and showing him that the kingdom is is beyond him and the lord is providing an opportunity for him to engage with the kingdom where the kingdom is working rather than him trying to make the kingdom work where he is does, does that make sense yeah and so the in the book of acts you see the apostles are behind the curve of the kingdom they're behind the curve of the holy spirit the holy spirit is working and it is the it is the lord's accommodation of them to be involved in in, in that work that opens up them up to be a channel of the kingdom but the kingdom is still working now i say that because <clears throat> we need to understand it in the context in which jesus came there was there was going to be the end of two kingdoms the kingdom of israel was coming to an end it was a climax and the rome was coming to an end the jews and the gentile world was coming to an end that's why in corinthians it says these things happen to them as examples it's citing moses and egypt um, and were written down as warnings for us unto whom the culmination of the ages has come so in other words when the gospel comes to us through christ it's because there's a, 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 a bigger narrative going on in which the world that we live in is coming to an end as a result of the kingdom's work. And we are as refugees being delivered from that world into his new world. And that, in that context, Paul cites in Corinthians the way we should think. It's like one world is ending, one kingdom's ending, a new kingdom is opening up for you. But that kingdom existed before it opened itself up to you. And so linking back to the question about education, I would say, I would say, how does, and, and this is a question that you would, uh, I would offer as, as one to the Holy Spirit, which is one of saying, how does an education that I'm seeking contribute to the wrestling my wrestle from Jacob to Israel. How does how does the education that I, I'm having contribute to me becoming a better co-laborer with the kingdom as it progresses forward? And not forgetting that the purpose of our education in Christ is to incarnate the new creation. It, that's the purpose of it. And I think so often, I, I remember... Uh, years ago uh, I was in the process of writing a curriculum um, and I was writing it out and I was talking to a gentleman that, that came at the time and this is this is when I was in the church and he was very interested he had sat in some of the classes he listened to some of the teachings and he said to me he said you know oh this teaching is is, is absolutely excellent are you going to get it certified um and I said, why would I, why would I get it certified? I said, this is, this is teaching about the kingdom and about citizenship. The certification is, is living epistles, people that become citizens. That's the purpose of it. And it, it boggled his mind that I was writing something that would not have a formal certification to it. It boggled his mind that what I was writing, um, which I consider to be simply a contribution to unpacking the kingdom in this world, it boggled his mind that I did not envisage that out of it, it would produce ministers. And, and, and he struggled, his mind had to, was struggling to stretch to this notion that we could write um, from our experience and from our, our revelation, wisdom and understanding, that necessary wisdom that contributes to the effective incarnation of Christ and manifestation of the new creation and and with with the aim of maturing people into citizenship he struggled to grasp that and i I think that's uh, that helps us to understand that a mind that cannot first fathom the kingdom working outside of the scope of its senses will often take snapshots of that kingdom as it works and turn it into tabernacles of schools of thought 
but aren't led by the prophetic agenda of the kingdom. I think I'll land there. <laughs> Great. Follow me as I follow Christ, I think, is what, what Paul said well. <laughs> yeah, that's... Um, I, I, I'd like to point you about out, Frederick, about the fact that the kingdom has been here and that uh, we should not, like dominate but really work with what has already been established and get god's mind on um what we should be doing and uh to your point about uh, also with the education part how is this contributing how is this making me in my personal wrestle how do i get from jacob to israel um and then even being aware that i need to make a transition you know Sometimes people have been so insulated in religion until they, they have not even seen that there's a space for growth. And pretty much what they're doing is they're waiting for the Lord to return. That's what they're waiting on. And there's, there's no activity going on other than sitting and waiting. And so there are people who, who feel that way as well. So I think it's important for us to, to look. I mean, Jesus mentioned two things to Nicodemus. He said, except you're born again, right? You cannot see. And then, if, and then he says, and then again, you have to be born again so you can enter the kingdom. So there's this issue of seeing before entering. And um, so there's something to be said about this process that we need to, uh, to look at and just revisit when it comes to, the, again, I keep saying reorientating but it's not going back to where we were, but to go back to the original plan and intention of God for us to see and how we're to carry on in the earth. I love what David said about the issue of uh, the police, uh, the police department. That's what the kingdom does. It brings a transformation into um, an environment and upon people. Uh, it doesn't take over, but it, it, it brings a, a transformation. It, integrates into the space and then it claims it like tea does like tea does for uh like a tea bag does in water what's inside the tea bag influences the water so much so there's a name change it goes from water to tea just by abiding and that's a picture of uh, some of what of a picture of what the kingdom does once yeah. it touches humanity that's right anyone else Thank you for comments and questions uh, today. What a beautiful presentation, David. Thank you for sharing and provoking us in this conversation today to be able Thanks to see God. and to, it's just so great having you. We, we appreciate uh, your humility, uh, just the, the, the man that you are, the great statesman in the faith. We really appreciate your example and, uh, and what you shared with us here today. So thank you very much. Thank you for all of our contributors. Those of you that have made uh, statements and comments, we will get uh, last week's uh, um, recording out to you and this week's. And there may be some subsequent information that we get out to you soon as we get our hands on it. So uh, if you're on our email list, please know that we will get these out to you uh, some point today or tomorrow. All right. Well, we want to thank you very, very much again for being a part of our uh, the global kingdom conversation and we're looking forward to next week uh we're trusting that andy will be with us and he'll be sharing some things uh from his heart and uh things related to our conversation so we want to bid you farewell good night good afternoon good day goodbye thank you thank you david hi bye everybody <laughs>